Okay, so before I get started, I'm going to tell you a quick story, okay? Not a story that I'm incredibly proud of, but it's, it is relevant somehow, tenuously. So recently I completed the um, Worthing Half Marathon, which isn't necessarily a massive achievement for me, but um, as a recent father, I felt, I felt like it was my first event, I was, I was pretty chuffed to, to complete it. Wife and child waiting for me at the finishing line, a couple of friends, happy, congratulations, and things like that. Um, all I could think about was how ravenously hungry I was. Okay? And when I get that hungry, I sort of get quite angry. And all I could think about was jacket potato. And no other food would do. It had to be a jacket potato. Don't ask me why. Jacket potato was the only thing that, that would do. Okay? And I dragged my poor wife, a child in the buggy, and my friends all around Worthing, every single cafe, restaurant, eatery in sight. I'd walk in, have a quick look, um, could I see a, a jacket potato oven? Could I see jacket potato? And was jacket potato the first thing I saw as I walked in? No, it wasn't in and out of every single cafe, getting more and more hungry, more and more angry as, as time went, went by. Didn't see a single jacket potato and ended up with two slices of cold toast. Um, and to, to express how, how personalization would have worked in, in that instance, if I'd have walked into the first place, they'd have waved at me, said, hi, Steve. We've got three jacket potatoes waiting for you with, with some warm beans on it. I'd have sat down, eaten my jacket potatoes, it would have been a lovely experience. I'd have been appreciated and, and it would have been happy days, okay? And what that sort of underlines is the impatience of users, of customers in, in today's day and age, really, okay? As we have more and more technology to do the thinking for us, and we become more impatient as users. and, and the more a website or a piece of technology can do the thinking for us, the better, okay? The more likely we are to drive engagement, the more likely we are um, to drive a sale, whatever our end objective is, we are more likely to do that if we're able to offer the user some, some level of personalization, okay? So that's where, that's where we come in, from a personalization level. So I've been specializing now in personalization for six years. I've just moved down from Luton to Brighton. Not many people ask me why I made that move, because if you've ever been to Brighton and to Luton, it's pretty damn obvious. Um, and I was working for, for TUI, which is Thompson First Choice Head Office, for um, the last six years as well, specialising, as I said, in, in personalisation. Um, from there, I grew, I grew the, um, the CRM programme by using personalisation from £100 million pounds, um, per year attributed sales to over 600 million pounds um, sales uh, per year attributed to CRM. Okay, and, and coming back to that point of overt and covert personalization, it was all done through covert personalization. Okay, so covert might not sound like the friendliest word, but it was not, not shoving the, the personalization down your throat. It was given to you in a subtle way to help your, your user experience and, and, and to generally hold your hand. Um, and just make, make the decisions for the user. And what I'm going to do, to do right now is just talk you through how I went about establishing the first personalization project for TUI back in 2010. And this clicker was actually working when I tested it, but not now. <coughs> there we go. Okay. So, the way I see it, in my mind, there are, there are three very basic ways of personalization, okay, or, or marketing in, in general. You've got your mass marketing, which isn't really personalization at all. That's your one-size-fits-all uh, message, your mass, mass market message that, that everyone sees, everybody sees the same message, okay? You have then got your segmented marketing, so you, you put users, you stereotype users into certain in certain buckets, so football fans, tennis fans, and golf fans, or jacket potato fans, toast fans, and some other type of food fan, <laughs> whatever it might be, I'm not a chef, so I can't elaborate any more on that. Um, and then one-to-one -one marketing, which is, is essentially looks at you as a user, what drives you, what, you know, what are you interested in, what is your behavior telling us, um, what can we accurately define um, and, and, and what can we offer you that we wouldn't necessarily offer this person, this person, this person, or even this person within your segment? So it's not only what are you interested in, but what is driving that decision, okay? What is driving you to make that decision to buy um, 
whether it might be a jacket potato. So for me, it was desperate hunger, but for someone else, it might just be that they love the texture of jacket potatoes. Other people might like, I don't know, the, the size of them or the feel. Or again, I'm not a chef, so I really know nothing about food. So this is probably a really bad example. Um, and then. The way I sort of define it in layman's terms, mass marketing is where most people currently are. Segmented marketing is, is what most people are uh, having a go with. And one-to-one -one marketing is, is really what, what everybody should be trying to achieve. Okay, so it's the holy grail of personalization and marketing. That doesn't mean that you should only be doing one-to-one -one marketing. You, sh you, you, sh you should still be doing everything. Okay, um, and definitely one one-on-one -on -one personalization and segmented personalization, they work really well together, okay? So, how do you go about putting together a personalization strategy? And it can be incredibly, incredibly daunting, especially if you're not used to using data and, and, and large amounts of data. You, If you speak to anyone that knows what they're talking about, they'll start throwing jargon at you and talking about big data and data mining and, and start trying to confuse you. And, and, um, for this type of thing. So you need to define your objectives. So what is it that you are trying to achieve? Is it increased user engagement? Is it increased revenue? Is it increased retention? For me, it was all of the above. For you, it might be a completely different set of objectives. So you really need to have a think through what is it that you, as an individual, as a company, as an organization, what are you trying to achieve? Okay, how will you achieve it? Sounds Sounds incredibly simple, but unfortunately, many people tackle a project and do not consider these, these basics. Um, and, and realistically, when will you achieve it? And that's not saying by the end of next month or something to try and impress your board director, because that's, that's realistically not going to happen. So it's setting a, a realistic, achievable timeline. Okay, so step one, you've, you, you, you know what you want to do. You have a rough time on, on, on how you want to go about doing that. So you need to have a look at the data. And it really isn't that difficult. So let's let's bring up a, a, a really bog standard chart, and from there we can see that. And here we're talking about big data and other other meaningless words really that people like to throw out there. Um, people only use five percent of the data available to them currently. Um, marketers don't think that they collect data enough um, or frequently enough. Marketers say that they they don't tend to use actionable insights from the data they have available to them and a small amount of organisations use um, real-time on-site behaviour to personalise the experience. So what does that actually mean? Um, what do you need to do in order to go about making sense of that data and personalising the user experience? Okay. So have a look at what data is actually available to you. So many organisations, companies have, have source of data over here, source of data over here, and source of data over here. Okay. And none of these departments are talking to each other. So you might have your, your email data in one, one corner. You might have your web data in another corner. You might have, I don't know, preference center data over here and app data over here. Different people managing it all and, and it's not coming together whatsoever. So you've got different teams of people working with different sources of data. You need to bring all of that together. Okay. Once you have it all together, you need to have a good think about how can it be segmented. Okay, so I've got all of this data, it's a big blob of data. How do we go about actually sensibly using that and actioning some, some insights? Okay, so how can it be segmented? And then, so at two, a couple of examples of the, of the data we had coming in. Uh, email engagement data, we had geo data, we had everybody's favorite and my least favorite, which is preference center data. We had retail inquiry data, web search data, shortlist data, previous book industry, blah, blah, blah. Yep. What is preference center? Preference center is when you go onto the website and you say, I'm interested in X, Y, and Z. Okay. Um, so, you, so a user generally um, goes on and says, I'm interested in um, whatever it might be, X, Y, and Z, and then their behavior actually um, the next day shows that they're interested in actually A, B, and C, or the, or the week after, whatever it is. Most people use that preference center data, you know, a day later, a week later, a month later, that preference center is, is the holy grail. Okay, so it's fallible because it's, it's self-reported. Yes. Yeah. Sort of. yeah, so there's two problems with it in, 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 the, in the way I see it is, first and foremost, just because in your head you might say, I'm interested in buying a Ferrari or, you know, realistically, you're, looking, you're actually in the market for a Fiesta, but in your mind, your ego, it's, it's, it's a Ferrari, do you know what I mean? And secondly, 
people's preferences change when you start researching and thinking about the product. Actually, that Ferrari, even if you are in the market for that Ferrari, you have the money if you're lucky enough um, to have that. A Porsche might be more similar, or I don't know. Again, I know nothing about cars, so I really have no idea why I'm using that example, uh, but you, you, you get the drift. Okay, so, so how can the data be segmented? Um, if you get different sources of data, that's already a, a form of segmentation. Um, the best thing to do, or something that I enjoy doing and, and find real use in, is creating a data hierarchy. Okay? So not all data is equal, is formed equally. As I've already said, that I'm not a big fan of, of preference sensor data, so when people are telling you what their, what their interests are, I, I tend to like to look at customer behavior, user behavior. Okay? So as I've already gone through, this is what I had available to me at, at TUI. And then what I did, I went through and I, I, I put that together in an order of priority. So which source of data, okay, which data that you have available to you is going to drive the most personalized experience? Because surely and logically that should be the, the, the data feed that you focus on. Okay? So again it comes down to simplicity. A lot of people get baffled by the amount of data they have in front of them. You need some way of breaking that down and using that in, in a logical um, and achievable way. Okay, so for me, web search data absolutely sat on top. That was the, the freshest data that was that was you know consistently being updated, consistently being fed back through into a single customer view database. Um, shortlist data from there when they when they found something they liked they said okay I'll shortlist this because I'm interested in it but again that's a form of preference so that quickly goes out of date um, similar to retail in retail inquiry data you go into a retail shop and you say I'm interested in this feedback through and we can put, um, repurpose that to the website um, email engagement data which which could still be fresh and up to date but again it's more limited in the scope of what it can offer you um, previous booking data Again, um, it becomes out of date very quickly. Preference center of data I've gone through, and geo data um, is useful, but again, it's not going to give you a massive breadth of, of what you can do with it. Okay, so I'm going to talk about quick wins very quickly um, and, and very very shortly. But essentially, what you can see from there is, as a user, if you only have number seven, you use geo data, um, and, you, and you sort of work your way up and start to collect more information. So maybe the um, you capture someone's email address as part of that sign up process, you may get their, their geo data, their email engagement data, you start using those two things, you engage them onto the website, they drop a cookie, they start interacting with your website, um, and you can start repurposing them with, with more uh, rich forms of data. That makes sense? Okay, um, so before you really get stuck into your personalization project, and again, this is, this is the thing we're going to keep coming back to, is, is Simplicity is key, okay? So the basic marketing principle is, is the, um, many of you would have heard it, the KISS, keep it simple, stupid. Um, remember it back from my, from my uni days. Um, but it really is true, and with data, you, you have so many options available to you, you need to, you need to look for the quick wins. Um, so what data is available is, is, is available to you right now. Remove the complexity from it. <coughs> what can you implement quickly and cost-effectively? So that might be very simply, if you're, if you're recognizing email clicks, then you could, if someone clicks on, um, so for TUI, if someone clicks on a couple's holiday or a family's holiday or a luxury holiday or whatever type of holiday it is, an email would be triggered the next day based on, on what they've clicked on. And then we'd recognize that you had geo data in there so we could populate offers from your local airport and that type of thing. Basic, segment, basic segmentation, basic personalization, but that really built up a picture and really started to, to help with that personalization picture. Okay, basic retargeting, basic personalization, <coughs> impact. you don't need to jump in with the all singing or dancing program before you can make a massive impact. So look for the quick wins, wow everybody at your organization with the numbers and then look to do something a little bit cleverer. Okay, so what does that look like? So when you're looking at the customer data, have a look at multiple things. This changes depending on, on what your organization does. 
So at, at TUI, obviously they were buying holidays, I'm talking as if everybody knows what TUI is, but essentially it's a package holiday company, it's just Thompson holidays and first choice holidays. Um, so it's a big considered purchase. I'm now working with the student room, which is essentially a, an online community of students that, um, that, that there's many forums, there's many uh, learning tools and things like that. Okay, so TUI was all about selling holidays, student rooms all about engaging the user and, and enhancing the user experience to keep them coming back. Um, so you have a look at where they look on the site, what they're doing on the site, what we know about them as a person, so are they male, female, old, young, um, fit, unfit, that type of thing, whatever might be useful to you, build up a profile of not only what they're doing, but who they are as a person. Um, so for here, this was countries they showed interest in, but whatever it might be, uh, products, anything, anything of, of that nature. Um, and also what their past purchase tells you. So it's, it's sort of wrapping it up and building up a picture, an image, um, an understanding of who the customer is, okay? Um, to elaborate on that point, again, keep it, keep it simple. Find an area of focus, okay, and conduct analysis. So the next point is make your assumptions, find the data that you're interested in, and then conduct analysis. And this comes back, I don't think it was Harry's presentation, I think it was the other one that said um, search panel is an excellent tool to, to look at. So the first thing I did with TUI was I had to look at the search panel okay, as, as one of the main key ingredients of the website, the thing that drove essentially the vast majority of the engagement. Broke down exactly how a user behaves with that, with that tool and really um, built out personas essentially for, for each person. I worked out whether they were a um, cold user, a warm user or hot prospect, essentially, so how close are they um, to purchasing holiday? <sighs> Once you've done that, and I'll, I'll go into that in a little bit more detail. Once you've done that, you need to start thinking about defining your rules, okay? So it's about leveraging the customer behavior. So understanding what they're doing on the website, but also understanding who they are. So if they've been looking at um, holidays to Tenerife, for example, in this example, um, obviously we can, we can give them that specific holiday to Tenerife. So we've known that they're looking for a holiday to Tenerife, departing from May, departing from London Gatwick, etc, etc. We can build all of that up from their, from their web search and we can retarget that to them, of course we can. But what we can also do is communicate that message in the best way. Okay, So we can recognise if they're a family, they're interested in family holidays, we can recognise um, if they're um, a young couple, an older couple, luxury holidays, maybe cruises, things like that. So it's, it's about building up a, a picture of who these people are. Um, again, you consider your objectives, so you have to come back to your objectives. There's no point in out this wonderful piece of, of, of personalization if it doesn't tick, if it doesn't sell, sell holidays in this, in this occasion or from what I'm currently doing, um, sort of personalize the, the user experience. Brainstorm, again, it's something that's, that's incredibly basic, but I wouldn't have launched Half of the programs that I had wouldn't have had even 25% of the success that I've had if I didn't collaboratively brainstorm with 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 others. Okay, it's the most important thing that, that that I could possibly recommend is getting people in front of that data and brainstorming it and, and, and getting other people's ideas and um, input, and then draft the brief. It's pretty obvious, but um, that brief needs to be solid. If it's going out to a third party agency, you need to make sure that, that um, you agree deliverables and, and um, that they know exactly what they're, what they're doing and that's all documented because otherwise you'll come back with a half finished piece of work that's, that's not ticking the box. Okay, and penultimate slide, you'll be pleased to hear so everyone can get down to the pub. Um, so what is the finished product for me, for, for TUI? We looked at personalised content based on recent web search behaviour. We looked at content that was based on their propensity to book. So it's, a, it's about putting the right holiday in front of them, but also looking at, at what stage of that buying cycle they're in. Okay, So holiday to Tenerife, um, but they're not actually that interested in holiday at the minute, so give them more content. It's about tone of voice, so giving them family holiday versus couples holiday. Um, and also people like you recommendations. So if we don't know quite enough about you, um, we built 
a little algorithm that said, okay, people that are also that are interested in Tenerife also look at Lanzarote and Jamaica or something like that. Okay. What that looked at looked like. So initially, um, back in 2010, we built that into into an email program. Okay, an email follow-up program that was constantly watching and evolving um, your uh, how you behaved on the website, and then sending you emails based on what your engagement was. Okay. So the first email, you receive this as a one-off, we put you in the cold stage. It looked at basically, I'd say take it back to that, um, how you interact with the search panel, how many searches you were doing in a seven-day period to define you as a cold prospect, a warm prospect, or a hot prospect, okay, and measuring that against um, other users. So we, we labeled you as being in the research stage, at which point we gave you an onboarding program, which helped you understand the website, sort of held your hand essentially, um, as, you, as you progress through your experience and try to get you back onto our website versus our competitors' websites. Um, helpful content, less sales focused, and lots of people like your recommendations just to help you along. Um, then the warm, warm <coughs> prospect. So at this point, they're still starting to build up an idea of where they want to go on holiday. So this person might think, okay, I want to go somewhere warm. The other person might think, I want somewhere that's nice for families. I want somewhere where I can just get completely and utterly shit face. Whatever it might be they're looking for a holiday, um, we were able to put up a picture of, of that person based on their behaviour across the website. Um, so we give them we give them content driven information rather than just bombarding them with, with um, prices at this point. Okay, so broader set uh, we give them sales messages with broader messaging, um, content focus over sales. And then if the program's done its job they move up to the final tier, which is the hot prospect, the booking stage. This is this is when they're really on the edge. They're, they're going to book a holiday, whether it's with us or whether it's a competitor. This 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 customer is going to book a holiday. Okay, so what we need to do here is recognise that they're on the verge of booking a holiday, and give them the sales focus content, give them the offers that are specific to their engagement. And um, there was a fourth email in here that would resend. Um, continuously, if their engagement continues, okay, so that email would continually engage them along the process until either they booked a holiday or they stopped engaging with us, at which point, most likely, unfortunately, they would have booked Thomas Cook or another competitor. Okay, so that's, that's, that's the program. I won't go into too much detail about how we did it, so with TUI, essentially, we, we built via an agency, everything in-house, so all of, our, all of our development was done um, through a third party partner, essentially through an agency. Um, with the student room, we're using multiple agencies, so we're using Amasis for our email personalization, we're using Dynamic Yield to personalize the website, and we're also using um, Crux, which is a DMP, which is a data, um, data management platform. So essentially, Crux looks at putting people in the, in the relevant segments and then pushes the same segments out to the web, which is done over yield, out to crop, um, sorry, uh, Marsis, which is an e email tool, and essentially what you receive in there, the customer will start to receive a joined up experience across channels. Um, so in the summary, define your objectives, create data hierarchy, look for quick wins, analyze and understand your user behavior, and define your rules. Launch, analyze, and tweet. Okay, so constantly evolve. Once you once you've launched something, constantly evolve, constantly analyze, constantly tweak what you're doing. And with personalization, I've given examples there for TUI, but every single person in this room is going to have a different user with different um, different expectations. And every user takes a different journey across your website. So really, these these are principles, but it's up for up to everybody in this room really to sort of process that information decide on the best way to, to treat their own customers. Um, and that's it from me. Any questions? Patrick. Um, so the personalised content, I'm getting at two forms, emails and essentially the website. Yep. So emails, I can kind of see how you break very specific personalised content. On the website, 
how far, how much of the page is going to be personalised? Was it just a, a box in the corner or? Yeah, so we're talking about, so it was relatively easy with the way we had our website um, set up. So we'd have a hero banner and then you'd have um, what we call three teasers. Um, so as time progressed, we'd personalise the hero banner and again, start off simple. So it would start off based on season. So we'd always have three seasons on sale, um, summer, uh, well, either two summer and one winter, or two winter and one summer, um, and it would give you whichever the commercial offer was for that season. Um, and then from there, the, the teasers underneath would be a little bit more specific. And as we test and learn, um, we'd, we'd become more comfortable with, with making that main banner more specific. But obviously, as you say, with the high volume of traffic coming through, it's more of a risk. Um, so it's baby steps and constantly learning and evolving from, from what we were doing. So it's almost like you were kind of taking over what yeah. would have been a third party advertiser space on another side and using those yeah. areas as the area that you would target personalised content, whereas the main part of the page would still be the main functionality where you could see everything. Yeah, 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 I suppose so. So with TUI, because we, we sold our own product, we wouldn't have any third party advertising. So the, so yeah. the hero banner would be um, our product anyway, so it would just be putting a more relevant product in front of you. Um, yeah, your example is more similar to what we do at Student Room, where we do have third-party um, ads. So I'm sort of I'm, I'm totally non-commercial anymore. I'm all about driving engagement because um, the arm of the business that, that makes the money is through sales. So they make more money if we generate more engagement. But for me, I'm totally removed from that. So yeah, for for now, I would never. We are looking at personalising the ad spots and, and looking at, um, at reducing them, but. So the user sees less adverts, but the sales team still sees the same amount of engagement. So essentially improving the user experience that way, um, but without upsetting the sales team essentially. So we'd never necessarily replace the ads outright, but we are testing an approach that will reduce the impact of those adverts to the, to the user. Did you meet <coughs> much resistance, or did you get many haters, or did you get people, oh, <laughs> uh, was, it, was it pretty smooth? Um, yeah, so we were saying with Harry earlier, um, personalisation, especially when I started back in 2010, it still is pretty pretty new and, and, and pretty out there. Um, so I suppose I was lucky, I was, I was given a budget and a remit and, and, and told to go out there. Um, but obviously it affects every area of the business and you're always dealing with, with you know, with email. If, if you use email as an example, um, you'll have sales teams, product teams, everything coming to you and saying, we want this email, and so we want this Tenerife email, Tenerife struggling, um, so we need to put that push the entire database, or um, I don't know, war's just broken out in this holiday destination, therefore we need to push it to everybody. Be like, actually, no one's going to interact, interact with that Tunisia content or something like that, <laughs> where a, a, a maniac's just you know, gunned down all these people. Um, but from a product point of view, they'd be pushing that because from, they don't see it from a customer's point of view. So you're always going to have that sort of resistance from um, a customer-facing team and, a, and a, a more commercial-facing team. But as soon as you can, you can prove the worth. So, like I said, the, from my tenure at TUI, we we raised the the um, revenue from 100 million to 600 million pounds in revenue attributed to CRM and it when they can see those numbers increasing and, and digital is very measurable. It's not like when you stick a TV ad out there and you say it's done well mm -hmm. and people just have to take your word for it. It's very measurable. So every time I launch something, like I said, I had clear objectives um, and I was able to measure against every single one of those objectives. So if anyone did show me resistance, I was able to say, actually, yeah, okay, I see your point, but if we do it my way, we're going to still generate you as much money as we would for whatever war zone you're trying to promote, but we'll also be making a lot of money elsewhere too. Yeah. Um, you, a few slides ago you were talking about analysing the data and then uh, defining a brief potentially yep. for a third party. Can you say a bit more about what that brief would be for and what it would be? Yeah, okay. Um, so if we, take, if we take the email program for example, so we'd, we'd have a look at the search bar um, I'm, I'm no data analyst, so I'd, I'd put together a data brief uh, based on what I'd seen from the search bar. I'd say, okay, can you have a look at the, the, uh, the, um, the activity across the, the search panel on the website? Present that back to me. I would then have a look at the data when it's in a more consumable format, graphs and things like that, pretty pictures, 
and then I could say, oh wait, actually look for look for trends within that. Once I found the trends, then I would I I would say, okay, it's clear that um, there's a pivot point at seven days where customers go from um, researching a holiday, not really booking. There's a clear spike here where customers start to research. Therefore, I'm going to make seven days my pivotal point. Okay, and I work from there and I say, okay. Essentially, I write that brief and say, right, okay, I'll have two warm-up emails and two heavy sales-focused emails. I'll start to write all the logic as I see it um, in, into a document. I'll present that to the to the agency or whoever's doing the work. It could be internal, it could be external. I present it to them. They either tell me I'm completely insane, it's not not doable, or hopefully they tell me, okay, this is doable. It's going to cost a lot of money, but it's doable. Um, and then I go back and, and rewrite the brief based on sort of their technical input give it to them, they, we work with them, work together to implement it, make it live, and then either it works or it completely explodes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hopefully I can answer your question. The, it's, a, it's tangential, but you, you mentioned a couple of times the, uh, the, the what is it, 500 million or whatever, the uh, uh, attributable change yeah. to. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I'd like to Get that, get that kind of information from my clients to be able to say yep. uh, how much have I helped with your business. Yeah, yeah. What, what methods do you use to say, right, this is attributable to? So two main measures that, that I would use is number one is attributed and then another one that I, that I haven't um, mentioned is incremental, which is, is if you were to speak to clients, it's probably the, the most powerful. Um, for attributable, what we looked at for email specifically, so um, that was that figure was for, for the CRM programs so for, for email. It was um, essentially if, if you've clicked on an email and then purchased a holiday within 30 days, then that sale will be measured back to your um, to, to, to the uh, program. 30 days essentially was because holidays were seen as a, as a, um, a considered purchase. So it's not something you just go online and purchase there and then within the session. It's something that you know, we, we might get you onto the website thinking about it, but then um, it takes, takes a while for, the, for you then to complete the purchase. However, we saw, I'd say, 90% of all revenue fall within the seven day window of interacting with our activity. Um, and then, in, probably most people are familiar with incremental anyway, but essentially, when, when we measure incremental, um, take, take the database as a whole, you take out a, a percentage of that database so, um, across. What we used to do was, was segment the database. I may open another can of worms here, but I, I like to segment my database by engagement. So the highest engaged people here, never engaged people here, and then everybody in between here. So if you send an email program today, you're only sending it to engaged people. Another day, you might send it to everybody. But what that means is people at the bottom never receive it or only receive it once a month. People at the top receive it frequently and everybody, everybody's happy with that approach. So you take people from all different segments, put them aside, you take another um, part of people, you totally stop emailing them for say three months, you measure the uplift of the people that don't receive anything versus the people that do. If it's 10-20% um, then you apply that 10-20% figure to the overall attributed figure. So we made um, 500 million pounds total revenue then, and, and it was 10%, you could say, okay, 50 million of that is simply because we got up and did our jobs, and, you know, attributed to us specifically. N nothing else had a part in that, in that purchase. Yeah. Yeah. Um, have you ever had any experience <clears throat> with extreme false positives where no matter how much information you've gathered, you've gone ahead with an approach and it turns out you were missing one vital piece of information that actually turns everything on its head? Um, so it's, it's hard. To, so in that scenario, it'd be hard to say until you were presented with the information. I think so. Mm. There could be unexpected like, results. Yeah, there could be something yeah. totally missing that would really help that program. But until I, I found it, and there, there were always, you're never going to have the perfect program. There's always going to be something missing. Um, and a lot of what what I did there was based on data, but a lot of it is always going to be based on assumptions, like when I say it comes down to brainstorming and things like that, you're never going to get the perfect program, you should never really strive for it, because as soon as you, you start striving for that perfect program, you never end up ever launching anything in the first place, so it's always better to launch something and build on it, 
and when more data becomes available to you, you can sort of implement and plug it in and, and work from there rather than always trying to strive for perfection, which really just doesn't exist. Hopefully that answers the hmm? question. We've got time uh, two more then. We've got two people there, so. Uh, did you see any difference in like conversion rate between kind of retargeting people with content they'd actually looked at and your recommendation engines? Yeah, so, um, yeah, the, I, had, I was just looking at this slide because I knew this question would come up and I've already forgotten it. Um, but I didn't, I didn't want to put any um, actual stats on there because I didn't think that's what to do. Um, but essentially, yeah, if we, if, if, we were, if we were doing that, we'd see maybe, um, and we looked at action rates, so an action rate of, on an email, for example, um, which, is, which is the easiest to measure, so it's the one I'm going to use as this example. Um, we would see an action rate of, of say, 60% for the people that we would um, target with their behaviour. And if we were sort of almost guesstimating what their behaviour might be, we'd still see an uplift, but it's going to be somewhere in the, in the 30 to 40% action rate. An action rate is um, of the people that opened the email, how many went to engage with it. Um, and then an, an, an average email could be anything between um, I don't know, 18 and 25% if it was just a, a box standard email. I just wanted to ask about how your um, approach to personalization has changed from to the student room. Mm -hmm. You have a different audience, they're yep. younger, more savvy to marketing, and yep. nurturing long term relationships. How mm -hmm. have you had to approach the personalization differently now at the student room? Yeah, it's, it's totally different. As I said, the business model is totally different, <clears throat> which is. Which is um, which is a, it's a, it's a big adjustment to go from sort of being commercially focused to being 100% user focused. Um, but then to look at the ways of which users, so even forget that they're totally different users, the, the actual websites themselves are, are worlds apart, dealing with essentially a forum versus a, a website that's, that's looking to sell. So um, what we've got now is, is almost a more difficult challenge. But what what we look what or what I'm looking to do is look for the quick wins again. So um, quick wins at the moment we have a website that, that has absolutely everything on it. So if you can I can just about remember back to when I was a student, but you have GCSEs, A level and um, uni, and at the minute everyone gets blasted with with everything. Um, so what we're looking to do at the minute is just segment by level and then from there we'll move down a little bit um, deeper and then again down deeper and down deeper and down deeper until we, we really personalise that experience but um, I could probably spend the rest of the evening talking about how different it is because everything is different but really that's 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 what should drive each and every one of us every every user is different every website every you know every experience is different and it's just about getting your head around it starting at a, a broad level and just drilling right down and, and doing what's realistic and achievable and, and moving from there Right, uh, round of applause for Satan.